It's remarkable the various different sources that have been used by Earth scientists in their attempt to reconstruct past environmental conditions. So, for example, environmental proxies have involved the use of uh, historical records, for example, oral, written and pictorial records. Uh, for example, uh, one aspect that's particularly well documented are a whole series of what were known as frost fairs um, in London in the period between about 1309 and 1814 when the River Thames froze on various different occasions. And you can see here that there are a whole sequence of these uh, events where the ice was actually thick enough to hold a fair um, on the River Thames. And this phenomenon has been linked to the Little Ice Age, which is an interval of time that in large part corresponds to the Maunder Minimum, though in fact the precise definition of the Little Ice Age and its duration is not particularly well constrained. The Maunder Minimum certainly uh, falls within it and um, that's an interval of low sunspot activity that may have contributed to the uh, climatic deterioration at that time. Just as an aside, one of the uh, phenomena that's been linked to this is uh, the suggestion that uh, Stradivarius uh, violins may owe their very distinctive sound to the fact that um, during this uh, cold interval, the tree growth was slowed. Tree rings were therefore reduced in thickness and the, the wood was denser, which may have impacted on the acoustical properties. So this uh, set of circumstances that hasn't been repeated since may actually be the reason why the tone of these instruments is so distinctive. Just a couple of other little, uh, quite literally, snapshots of how pictorial records can be used to reconstruct um, environmental change or at least to provide evidence as to the changes that happen over time. This is the Rhone Glacier uh, in Switzerland in a postcard from 1870 and you can see it camped on the outside of the town here. And if you compare that postcard with a modern day photograph, you can see how much glacial retreat there has been. And likewise, not using postcards this time, but actually using photographs. Here's um, one of the photographs of the Blackfoot Jackson Glacier in Montana in 1914, compared with another photograph of the same area in 2009, showing the change in the aerial extent of the glaciers. Written records too provide a um, narrative that can be used to interpret uh, the significance of environmental change and events. None of the details in this matter. This is just to show you that um, from an Irish context the uh, various annals that are available can be used to infer the presence of um, environmental conditions. For example, as you can see here, cold brings on famine and every kind of disease. Abnormal ice and much snow from the Epiphany to Shrove Tide, which would suggest from a date of around um, early January through to uh, the date of Easter and occurred later in January in that particular year. Now, these can't always be taken at face value, but their reliability can be assessed and in certain cases the dates given can be edited because the records can be calibrated to their documenting historical and astronomical phenomena that are of known dates. So in other words, if something is reported as being 20 years after a particular astronomical event, an absolute date can be put on it. And uh, what is interesting by this study by Ludlow and colleagues is that what they did was they identified then the various different events that were reported in the annals as representing some sort of environmental perturbation or environmental uh, deterioration. Uh, so they plotted these up in time. Uh, so there are cold events documented from the annals and cross-referenced them with abundances of sulphate from the ice core GISP-2 
that was drilled in Greenland. And um, there's a large number of these events reported in the annals that occur within plus or minus five years of known eruptive events recorded in the ice core. And those are the events that are shown here as the blue cross inside the red circle. And in fact, when you test the data, it's statistically significant. And their conclusion is that the annals are a record that's indicating repeated volcanic forcing of cold events recorded in the history of Ireland. More generally, when you look at the variety of paleoclimate proxies that um, geologists and earth scientists have used, there's an absolutely bewildering array of them. Um, so all of these are lithological, for example, on their own, just listed here. Uh, my own personal favourite is the use of rat urine as a paleoclimate proxy. What happens here is that the plant material is brought into the cave by the pack rat and ends up cemented in place by its urine. And the urine is very viscous because the rat needs to conserve water in an arid environment. It crystallizes out and it then actually welds in place whatever detritus has been brought into the cave by the rat. So over time, as these middens build up, um, if the material available to the rat changes due to um, environmental change, that will end up then uh, reflected in what gets cemented into its urine. But if we go back to the various different array of paleoclimate proxies that are available, they actually fall into three broad groupings. You have a whole suite of different proxies that are available uh, broadly linked under the term lithological. There's a whole suite of different geochemical analyses that can be undertaken on things um, such as organic matter, trace element chemistry, stable isotope analysis, and then a whole suite of proxies built around how organisms respond to environmental change. So we can broadly look at a series of case studies and a series of methodologies and assign them to one of these broad divisions. And in fact, what many studies do is they will actually integrate a series of different proxies together to build a stronger narrative. So even just by looking at this core drilled in the Mediterranean Sea, even without any analysis, simply from a visual assessment, we can infer that environmental conditions have changed. And there's a whole series of different parameters going on here. Uh, there's an input of dust, volcanic ash, sediments washing in from rivers, mass movement events, mudslides underwater, and of course, continually raining out and accumulating in these sediments will be the remains of the organisms that are inhabiting the water column above where the sediment is accumulating. I want to look at one particular lithological proxy for environmental change. What you're looking at here is a snapshot of images taken over three days showing a dust cloud entering and moving across the Atlantic sourced from uh, Western Africa. So you can see here picked up in these images then how this uh, dust cloud actually migrates from the west coast of Africa right across to the Caribbean in the course of the three days. So we're going to look at a study here that compares the dust flux record in a offshore site, uh, ODP, uh, which stands for Ocean Drilling Program Site 658C, which is a marine setting with two cores that were drilled in a terrestrial setting and lake deposits in these two oases that you see here. And our null hypothesis that we're going to test is that they should have an identical signal in terms of when dust is more prevalent and when it's less prevalent compared to things such as climatic changes, uh, source area changes, for example, the water level fluctuations in paleo Lake Mega Chad. So Lake Chad is shown here, but in the geological past, the 
lake extended over a much wider interval, broadly corresponding to what's known as the Bodell Depression. And so what we should see in terms of environmental change is that lake level uh, falling and rising, the volume of the lake decreasing and increasing, and as a result of that, more or less of the marginal areas around the lake being exposed and as a potential source of dust. Now, our hypothesis is going to be that if all of these events are synchronous across North Africa, we should see the same relative trends offshore as we do onshore. So let's start then by looking at the offshore site. What we can see here is that there is a fairly static rate of flux of sediment to the offshore site for most of the period 10,000 to about 5,500 years ago, then a relatively rapid rise, um, an increase in the flux at around 5,500 years and then stable until probably the last few hundred years where it becomes quite variable and fluctuates quite a lot. And this has been interpreted as a signal for an abrupt widespread aridification episode across northern Africa in the middle of the Holocene. So what we want to test is whether we see the same signal onshore in the lake sediments. So we have two lake sediment sequences. They've been dated by radiocarbon dating the Jicaria oasis and the Kashmarum oasis. They occur in an area known as the Manga grasslands. Uh, we have a stable dune system. We have annual grasses, shrubs, occasional trees, and oases form in the interdune depressions. What's quite important is that the surrounding sediments then are these highly permeable sand dunes, so we don't actually get any fine sediment input to these lake systems via surface water runoff. The water actually drains into the sands rather than enters into the lake. Uh, the key is that these lake sites could record an export signal from the Bodelli Depression about 800 kilometers to the northeast and that in turn will be a signal for whether the lake levels in Lake Megachad were high in which case we should see a decrease in the dust flux or low, in which case more of the margins of the lake will be exposed and more dust sourced from it and carried to the area to the southwest. What's quite interesting is that compared to ODP site 658, which we've looked at previously, there's a very different signal from each of these oases. From about 10,000 to 5,000 years BP, it actually seems to show a declining dust flux at this inflection point at around 5,500 years. There's a switch, but after that it's a very gentle, gradual rise in dust flux until about the last 1,000 or uh, 1,800 years or so, at which time there's a relatively rapid rise due to human activity. The key conclusion of this paper is that ODP site 658C, which has been uh, widely touted as indicating this abrupt widespread aridification over North Africa, may not actually be representative of all of the activity that is happening in the Sahara and to the south of it, the Sahal area, in the Holocene period. The case study looking at the environmental history of Elk Lake over the past few thousand years gives us an opportunity to actually look at how various different data sets can be integrated together as part of an overall analysis. Critically, the position of Elk Lake in the Upper Mississippi Basin uh, is particularly sensitive to climate change because it it sits at the intersection of three air masses that control the climate of North America. So you have the Gulf of Mexico air mass, which is warm and moist, and um, it dominates in the northern Great Plains during the summer and provides most of the annual moisture in the upper Mississippi basin. You then have the 
Arctic air mass, which is cold and dry, and the Pacific air mass coming in from the west here, which is dry. And they're key in winter months. Now, as a result of interactions among these three air masses, if you go to the Great Lakes region, you have a gradual north-south climatic gradient, uh, and then a steep east-west climatic gradient across Minnesota and into the Dakotas. And that's reflected then in the distribution of vegetation in Minnesota, and in particular in the position and orientation of the forest to prairie border. So what we can predict is that changes in how these air masses have interacted on various different time scales will cause a shifting in the position of the forest prairie border over time and that will be reflected in key variables such as the vegetation record that accumulates in for example lake systems. And what's interesting and what's known is that these changes that occur among the interactions of these air masses, they can be very rapid and extreme on human time scales. For example, whenever the Pacific air mass predominates, it's a principal agent causing drought conditions in the Great Plains. And the 1930s in America, the Dust Bowl years, are known as the Dirty Thirties. And of course, there was a significant human and societal impact of that particular episode of environmental change. So we're going to look at the varved sediments from Elk Lake in northern Minnesota. The um, interesting and the nice thing about these varved sediments is that they allow us to have a very high degree of temporal resolution and there are a variety of different biological, chemical and physical proxies available that can be examined to look at climatic and environmental change. We can distinguish between two components within the sedimentary record. There are those that are produced inside the lake, either biological, such as the uh, frustules or tests of diatoms, or calcium carbonate that's precipitated out of solution and the crystals then sank to the lake floor. And we can also identify an allochthonous component which will be things such as wind-blown silt and clay which is particularly rich in quartz that's blown into the lake and also uh, pollen from the surrounding vegetation that will be blown into the lake and then incorporated into the sedimentary record. So what you see over time here is a plot of a series of different variables. Uh, here's the var of thickness Here's the percent of sagebrush that's present. And then over here you have three other uh, parameters, the amount of quartz, the amount of sodium, and then the relative abundance of this diatom oligoceria. And what's quite interesting is that these um, variables all provide evidence for environmental change over time. So the amount of silt and clay is reflected in the thickness of the varves and the relative abundance of quartz, and that can be attributed to wind activity. The diatom oligoceria requires turbulence to keep it in the photic zone, so it's also a proxy for windy conditions. And the abundance of sodium can be a uh, and the abundance of sodium can be used as a proxy for environmental conditions as it's particularly sensitive to chemical weathering. It decomposes when exposed to moisture. So if you have wet terrestrial conditions, plagioclase will decompose. The sodium goes into solution and the record of it is lost. On the other hand, if you have dry conditions, it's harder to decompose that plagioclase it's retained in the soils rather than dissolving, and ultimately it ends up blown into the lake. So when you have dry episodes, you have high plagioclase content. So we can put these various uh, lithological, biological, and chemical proxies together with, for example, other biological proxies. So we're able to actually define 
the pollen content, how that varies through time and identify a series of zones. We can take the percentage sage bush and show that that too is not static over time and synthesize all these results together to make an environmental interpretation of the history of the lake. So for example then from around 10,000 to 8,005 years ago we have a spruce forest which is then rapidly replaced by a pine forest as the climate warmed. We have a significant episode from about 8,500 years ago to 4,000 years ago where we have prairie conditions established. This is when we see our peak for sagebush. Uh, also, we have strong evidence for the area being drier. And um, we see here that the amount of quartz blown into the set, uh, lake increases. This is also an interval in which bar of thickness tends to be higher. We see evidence for windy conditions based on the presence of this diatom that requires turbulence to keep it in the photic zone. And we're introducing feldspars from the soils into the lake as well. So collectively, what we're able to actually say at this particular interval is that the dry Pacific air mass exerted a dominant control over the climate of this region and more generally North America. And that's a signal that we see elsewhere at this time. There's a mid-Holocene drought affects a large part of North America and we've dune fields in places such as Minnesota and Nebraska. And from around 4,000 years ago through to today, we see a return to forested conditions with shorter-lived deviations away from that and a change over time as to which forest components dominate. It's currently dominated by conifers. For